Porn sites comprise 12% of the internet. Sex is one of God's holiest and most beautiful gifts to humanity. It's a tough one. Oh, is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> um. There have been wars started by sexual desire. And love is truly expressed when you offer. Lust is when you take. So often as Christians, um, we adopt the worldly understanding of love, right? Versus the godly understanding of love. Just pornography generates more money in North America than the MLB, NHL, NFL, and NBA combined. Welcome back, everybody, to the second episode of the COA Interview Podcast. Today, we're going to be tackling something a little bit more tricky, but I'm very excited to do it with uh, Father Gabriel and Father Anthony. Welcome, fathers, again. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Before we start, our podcast today is going to be on sexuality and the hypersexualization of our world. Again, tricky one. But before we start, I want to give you a few statistics. Porn sites comprise 12% of the internet. 90% of children ages 8 to 16 have viewed porn. The largest consumers of pornography are 12 to 17 year old boys. 25% of search engine requests are for porn, and 38% of adults say porn is morally acceptable. Clearly, this is not something small. I'm mm -hmm. sure both of you as father confessors hear in your confessions the struggles that boys and girls go through all the time. So before we go down that path, let's talk about first sex within the confines of the church. So what is the purpose of sex in the Orthodox Christian perspective? Very good question. Before we actually talk about its purpose, I think it would be important to premise something that is extremely important for us to keep in mind as we're having this conversation. Sex is one of God's holiest and most beautiful gifts to humanity. As he created us in his image and likeness, part of it was for us to be beings who were sexual. The sexual faculty was never seen or given to us so that it can be seen as something that is negative, something that is filthy, something that is to be avoided or sinful, but it has become something that can drive us towards sin, especially since the fall of humanity. So let's begin with recognizing that as Christians, we have to see that God's intention for human sexuality, it must be seen as something that is holy and beautiful when done properly in the right time, in the right commitment covenantally between a man and a woman in the sight of God. With that being said, we can now answer the question of what is its purpose? And the church has always thought that there's three major purposes or intentions behind human sexuality. Number one, I think the most obvious one that everyone will agree with is for reproduction and procreation. God gave it to us as the very mechanism by which our love can then lead to the creation of human life. Secondly, it is that very expression of the extreme intimacy and the passionate love that can exist between a man and a woman as husband and wife. It is the very expression. And lastly, it's to understand that God has given us this as a means by which we can express the sexual desires that we have in a holy and healthy way. So when a man and a woman are married as husband and wife, they can then share in that intimacy and it becomes an outlet for that sexual desire so that they are not inclined to use it in sinful ways. Those are the three major reasons and intentions and purposes behind sexuality as per the Orthodox Church. Okay. So then let me ask you, Father, you were, the last one was sexual desire and fulfilling the sexual desire. There have been wars started by sexual desire. Hmm. There have been crimes, murders, you name it driven by sexual desire. It seems like almost every chapter in the Old Testament has something that is driven by sexual desire that is not great, right? What is the purpose of such an intense sexual desire? Why would God put that in man and woman, and probably more so man, if it causes so much sin or drives so much sin? Mm. I mean, I think we have to differentiate between how God originally created a human being 
versus how the human being became after the fall. Again, in the New Testament as well, it's very different than the Old Testament. So in the New Testament, we are in the process of being recreated, beginning with the soul and God willing with the body. Uh, after this body goes on the ground six feet under, we get this spiritual body. In the Old Testament, however, after the fall, it was a completely different story. So if you look at how God created humanity, like if we, we can look at the human being as that has like, let's say, three compartments, if you will. So you have the spirit, the soul, and the body, right? And that's how the human being was created originally. So he was led by the spirit. So it was easier for the human being to pray, not, not to sin, to do all of these contemplations on God and all of these things that we know very well of. However, after the fall, there was a reverse like the human, the human he reversed, and the body is the one that was now taking the lead. So, this is what we currently call corruption, like the human, the corruption of the human nature. So, it has become increasingly more difficult now for the human being to do the right thing, right? So, it's, so it's much easier to fall into sin. It's much easier to cheat. It's much easier to to do all of those things, and and the instinctive or the instant of sexuality within the human being really took charge, right? So it became increasingly difficult for him and her, but especially for men, like you were saying, to, to control this sexual desire. And throughout the Old Testament, if we look specifically on this, we have to understand that in the Old Testament, humanity as a whole was not the same as in the New Testament. You know, when we look at the Old Testament, sometimes we look at it from the lens of the New Testament. So I'm reading something, living in the way I'm living now, doing the things that I do now. I'm looking at the Old Testament and I see how violent it is, right? Uh, how sexuality was a big problem and started many wars and rapes and all of these things. And that is true, but because humanity at that time was very different. And again, when you look at it from a violence perspective, they were very barbaric. Like there's so many things, the Roman Empire, the Greeks, like you, you can see all of those differences. So it was very difficult for humans to control their sexual desire at that time as well. And this is the whole part of salvation where God is coming and he wants to recreate us. But if I can butt in, Father. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard to read about Solomon, the thousand wives or concubines or whatever yeah. it was. That's a difficult thing to read about with the prism, like you're saying, of Christianity these days. And I don't know, maybe you can answer. Like, that's allowed. Why is God okay with it? I mean, he's called the wisest man to have roamed the earth and allowed to build the temple and thousand, thousand concubines. Like, it seems to me super outside you know, the norm of the God that we're used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a really important distinction that we have to make, especially when we are reflecting back on the things that we hear described very clearly in the Old Testament. I want people to get used to the idea of recognizing that not everything that is described in great detail in Scripture necessarily translates into God has prescribed it. What do I mean by that? It is not because the Bible is completely transparent and in the Old Testament it records all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly, that that necessarily translates into God therefore allows and blesses the good, the bad, and the ugly. So when you see so much sexual corruption, so much fornication, so much adultery in the Old Testament, that doesn't mean that God is blessing it. Because very clearly, the same God who says, I am the beginning and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, and that there is God has never changed. Scripture makes this very clear. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. When the Lord comes in the New Testament, and Jesus Christ is preaching to the people in the Gospel of St. Matthew, in chapters 5, 6, and 7, he then goes ahead and says very clearly that if a man even looks at a woman and lusts for her in his heart, he has now committed adultery. So it's very clear that God hasn't changed his standard. But what God is doing is that he's dealing with the people at the stage that they were at when it comes to their spiritual maturity. So did he allow Solomon to go ahead and have all of those concubines? Indeed he did. 
Some people might ask, why not strike him down? Well, I think for the same reason that God doesn't strike me down, thank God, every single time that I commit a sin. It is not because God doesn't strike me down that that means his tolerance of my freely expressed will translates into that's what he wants me to do. So I just want us to be careful in that narrative because, again, it's described, but it's definitely not prescribed. So it's a concession, in other words. It is. Mm-hmm. And, and you can see the difference, again, the contrast between pre-fall humanity and post-fall humanity, right? So when you look at Adam and Eve and how they're meant to be united as one, there was no, there was no third party there, right? But afterwards, mm-hmm. after the fall, it became a different story. And that's the whole point of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, right? So you were told a tooth for a tooth, but now I tell you, but to give the other cheek, right? So it's this progress that God is leading humanity from the temporary Old Testament law to the New Testament law, which was always the desire of his heart. So it's not as if God is changing his mind or God is different. God is the same always and forever, right? But the way he deals with humanity is different, and that's based on on the stage humanity is in because they are the ones who are changing. They are the ones who are progressing. So, Father, you alluded to if you look at a man uh, or a woman looks at a man or a man looks at a woman in lust, it's as if committed adultery. Mm -hmm. That takes me to the question of pornography, right? We started with all those statistics about pornography. Can we start with at least defining why it's such a problem if it's an act of one with themselves. They're not hurting anyone. They're not touching anyone. Can you clarify to people and to all of us, what is the big problem with pornography? Why is it a sin? Mm. It's a tough one. Oh, is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, can I go the whole way? Um, so, you're actually are hurting someone when you watch pornography and that person is yourself so 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 you are destroying the image of god within you so sin is not only something against another you can sin against yourself as well right um so for us to understand this we have to understand a bit of theology again uh, and what is love versus what is lust and how they're very different from each other. Um, So God is Holy Trinity, three persons in one, love each other unconditionally, humbly, right? And God creates marriage as a mirror to who he is. So you have three persons here, right? The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. You have three persons here, the two spouses within Christ. So you have three persons as well. And here you have unconditional love in between them. And therefore he asks the couple to love each other unconditionally because essentially marriage is something that teaches us how to love like God's love. So the purpose of marriage is to train us to love so we can be able to love the same way God loves So then I can share in the Holy Trinity. So love in marriage, I'm going to get to the pornography question. So love love in marriage is is sacrificial towards the other. So what I'm trying to get at is that love is given towards another person in Christianity. This is how we define love. So often as Christians, um, we adopt the worldly understanding of love, right? Versus the godly understanding of love. So, lust is something that is outside of that love. Lust is not love. So, I I cannot in Christianity love myself. Like loving myself within the understanding of Christianity just doesn't fit. So, when you look at lust or pornography, who is it that you're trying to please? Yourself, right? Is there love? Is there someone else to love there? Absolutely not. So, it becomes very selfish rather than something that is selfless. And the problem is that when you do that, you commit sin. And what is sin? Sin is something outside of God. So again, God gives commandments, right? If you want to find life, because I am the source of life, and you want to be like me, this is what you do, and he does it out of love. But when we step outside those commandments, then we start falling into the darkness, like 
not being with God. And that really affects our soul. So we are essentially destroying our own soul and the image of God within us when we watch pornography and we lust. And and this does not only apply to pornography, if, you, if Father Anthony would allow me just to, to proceed for another 30 seconds. Um, it involves masturbation. It involves uh, fornication and adultery for, for other reasons that I'm sure Father Anthony would like uh, to unfold for us. Mm -hmm. Can but, you actually, sorry, Father, mm -hmm. before you go, what do you define as fornication? So it's actually interesting that you asked that question because the, what we translate as fornication and sexual immorality in English today in the New Testament, in the original Greek was the word pornea where we get porn, pornography, right? All forms of fornication have always been understood as when you take the gift of sexuality and you express it outside of the parameters that are holy and righteous as defined by God in marriage. So when you understand it in that sense, it then brings us back to that point that Abuna was hammering in. You are, you are self-destructing when you expose yourself to pornography. And there's another aspect to this that I want to add to what, uh, what Father was saying, is that you got to remember when you're, when you're contributing to an industry that is holding so many men and women in slavery, your viewership, your participation in this is endorsing the sin of others. And when you objectify a man or a woman, you are completely acting without integrity towards the dignity that that person has when they bear the image and likeness of God. Mm. You are completely forgetting that that girl that you are staring at is a daughter of Christ, yeah. one that he died for, he shed his blood for her. And she is in sinful bondage in the industry that she is in. And yet here I am entertaining myself, acting like I'm not contributing to that, to that marketplace that is holding her into slavery. And now we haven't even gotten into the disaster of what is human trafficking and how there is such a huge population of young women and young men who are part of this industry that are there completely outside of their free will. It, it, is, it would be absolutely foolish to suggest that no one is being harmed. Abuna has done a wonderful job in explaining how you're self-destructing and destroying your soul, let alone how it is that you're contributing to the destruction of so many people's lives in the process. Okay, so take one person by themselves in pornography out of the equation take you know the the harm to someone else that you don't know but is part of an industry how about two people not married but they love each other or they're engaged or they've promised each other to each other them in that love engaging in sexuality sexual intercourse what is the problem there good question we have always understood the gift of human sexuality fully expressed in sexual activity as something within the confines of the commitment between a husband and a wife. And this goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, that when God creates Adam and Eve, he talks about how it is that Adam is called to take for himself this woman and make her his wife. So he says, for this reason, and this is interesting because even Christ himself in the gospel refers back to this. So this is no longer just something we could say, oh, that was Old Testament. No, Christ himself quotes this passage. He says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two of them will become one flesh. When God puts the parameters of them becoming one flesh, and by the way, this one flesh is not only symbolic and spiritual, it's meant to also be understood literally. They become one in the process of this holy and sacred sexual intimacy. When they become one, it is in this committed relationship, this covenant that exists between them as man and wife. When sex is taken outside of that, and it becomes nothing more than something casual, and it becomes something where there is no commitment, we're free to leave each other tomorrow morning if we don't like each other, if we grow out of love from each other, and there is only this committed thing where we just promise to each other until we feel like it, until we change our minds. But th this is not the, 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 the very parameters that God has put in place when it comes to a husband and wife. As a matter of fact, Scripture is so clear on this 
that when St. Paul the Apostle wants to give us the very image of the importance of this committed relationship, what is the image he gives us? Christ and his bride, the church. And what did this husband, this bridegroom, offer to his wife in this committed covenantal relationship? His very own life. There was this, there was no such thing as if I don't feel like it anymore, we can change our minds. There is sincere and real covenant. Sex outside of that covenant goes back to what Abuna was describing perfectly. Father, if you paid attention to what he was saying, he was saying something very important. He was saying love is truly expressed when you offer. Lust is when you take. In this committed relationship, you find the person that you say, I want to offer myself to. Not that I want to abuse and use for the sake of my own gratification and lust. And if I can add to that, <laughs> I'm going to go back to my example or about talking about the Trinity, right? So, so again, we are, marriage is a mirror of the Holy Trinity and it's like Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. They're, they're both there and they're both mysteries. And that's why marriage is a sacrament because you are united. So the three persons of the Trinity are united in one through love, right? And for us to be able to love like they love, we also are united. So mm. if I don't get to the point that there is this blessing and this covenantal love between us, then we are not united yet. So I can say, and if I'm not united, that means it's love done outside of God. So it's a fallen type of love. So I can say I love her as much as I want to love her, right? And I can say this and I can scream this. However, this love is not done in God yet. It's still outside of God and therefore it is still sin according to God's understanding. So Father, you uh, said the word image, which immediately made me think perspective. Mm. The world we live in has a very different perspective about sex and sexuality, experimenting. I mean, it's even part of the curriculum now for young children in school. And it's almost like there's a push, you know, for people to explore your sexuality as if it's like a science, an exercise that you have to do. What is this perspective, okay? And is there a way to reconcile it in any way with the Christian perspective? The short answer is absolutely not. There is no reconciliation between the definition that the world tries to push on us and our children when it comes to sex versus the very standard and definition that God proposes to us according to his standard and his intention for humanity. We forget that there is an agenda behind sex that drives the marketplace. The amount of money that is generated from sex in the world today is unfathomable. There is a statistic that talks about how it is that pornography alone, not the entire sex industry, just pornography, generates more money in North America than the MLB, NHL, NFL, and NBA combined. We're talking about billions of dollars. This is an industry that is driven by the fact that people freely offer themselves up the things that are so accessible to them. I think you shared the statistic in the beginning where you talked about 12% of the internet is mm. pornography. Like, I, I, need, I need our viewers to like let that sink in for just a second. 12%, so imagine, every company that has a website, every organization that has a website, every book that has been published, all of the content, all of Google, all of Wikipedia, all of that, and yet, more than one in 10 pages on the internet is pornography. And the reason behind that is because sex sells. This is why we see it in advertising. This is why we see it so much overly sexualized in the media, where, whether it be the, the music that we listen to or the videos that we watch, the movies. You ever, you ever watch a movie and then suddenly there is like this... this Unexplained this, sexual scene. There's a scene that has nothing to do with the plot. Yeah. But for some reason, it's got to be integrated into the story because... It attracts eyes. So when you realize that the world has an agenda to be able to make a profit over the fact that they're trying to sell you sex as if it was a commodity, whereas God is telling you this isn't a commodity, this is a covenant. There is no reconciliation. God is asking you to see it as something holy. 
They're asking you to see it as if it was something you can purchase and throw away the next day. So how can we reconcile when something is sacred and holy and beautiful and a gift from God, and now we've turned it into something that you can take, use, abuse, throw away, and walk away as if it doesn't cause you any harm. That, unfortunately, there is no reconciliation for that. We have to learn to adopt God's standard. Okay. So just to clarify, we're talking about reconciliation between those two perspectives, okay? But now, because we've all mentored youth, we, we, we know the struggle. Can we talk about the reconciliation for our youth that are struggling? Mm. The feelings of guilt, the feelings of shame. I think that part of this podcast is sitting down with our fathers as if they are our friends. They can be open about these things and we don't need to be ashamed. So this is the point where you can actually you know, look to the audience, the shame, the guilt, the addiction, those who are struggling, those who have tried and failed. We're all men. We've all gone through teens. We've all gone through all the hardships. What, what can you say? What, what is the, the way through this war, this fire that builds inside you know, our youth and, and those who are even married and aren't youth anymore but struggle? I think I would start by saying that this is not you. Your sin is not you. Mm. Your sin is apart from you. Your sin could be healed. If St. Moses the Strong was able to find his purity again, if St. Mary of Egypt, this wonderful saint, was able to find her purity again to the point that she was floating when she was walking, Right? It gives us an understanding of the power of God to bring back chastity once again within us. It is not us. Once we are baptized and the image of God is renewed within us, everything that we do as sin is almost just like dust. Right, so so it's just we go, we repent, we confess, we partake of the Eucharist. Obviously, it's it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's almost like that, right? So so it's not who we are. Sometimes these sins, the problem with them is that we allow them to identify who we are, and we see this often in sexual deviances, right? So people talk as if this is who I am, and and. And their identity becomes their sexuality. No, your identity is that you are the daughter of Christ or of God. You are the son of God. So this is definitely where I would start. Um, the one thing I want to add, however, is to run away from this sin as much as we possibly can. Um, maybe we can discuss the hows Right, how we can run away from this sin a bit, if you don't mind. Um, I think a big part of it is to really try to avoid the temptation altogether. Right? Sometimes we put ourselves in situations where I am tempted by something, right? and instead of shutting it down very quickly and very aggressively with this holy anger that God has built in me to say no to sin and to say no to the devil, I just allow you know the devil to 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 or allow like him to open the door. I I actually open the door for sin a bit, and then you know it becomes a very very difficult fight with sin. If I am wise enough and if I'm smart enough and if I'm strong enough to avoid the temptation altogether, I'll find that I'll do much better because I will not have within me this back and forth with sin. And the more that I allow the thought to grow in me, the more it becomes harder to fight. And evidently, I end up falling. I think the, the, the message that Father is giving right now is so important to so many of our young people who are carrying that shame and that guilt that you speak of, Paul. Um, you are not the sum of your sin. You are not simply the accumulation of your mistakes or your addictions and your passions. Your identity is in Christ and in Christ alone. And so when you give, give yourself over to the whispers of the devil that wants to convince you that there's no hope for you, that you fought this for so long, that you even hate the fact that you 
have this addiction to pornography, that you have this addiction to masturbation, that you have no idea what to do about the fact that you keep falling into one um, adulterous relationship after another. This has nothing to do with your potential. St. John Chrysostom says the statement that is so deeply profound. He says, Real repentance can turn every sinner into a saint, every harlot into a virgin. Hmm. This idea of being renewed is real. We believe in a God who makes all things new. Every day is an opportunity for me to say, I'm his again. Don't, don't focus on how much you fall. Focus on getting up. It, Pope Shenouda used to say this beautiful statement. It says, when you meet with God, he won't ask you how many times you fell, but rather he's going to ask you, why didn't you get up? Was my mercy and my love not evident to you? Why did you stay down? So if we keep fighting, keep struggling, if we run, like Father is suggesting, that we recognize the pitfalls, if, if, if lust is being whispered to me through the music I listen to, through the things that I decide to watch, the conversations I have at work or at school, if I am simply replaying uh, images that I have once upon a time allowed to enter into my soul and I'm fantasizing about those things and that's what I'm indulging on. If I don't break those cycles, then I'm not getting up, I'm staying down. There is always hope for every person. And I think it's extremely important for us to recognize that the church has placed the saints before us. Why? Because they are, they are perfect icons of God's love and mercy. When you look at St. Moses the Strong, when you look at St. Mary of Egypt, when you look at St. Augustine, when you take a look at all of these holy men and women who struggled, we didn't play, make icons out of them because they were perfect, but because they struggled and in Christ, they were victorious. We can do the same. Can I chime in on this? Mm -hmm. Another nice quote from St. John Chrysostom, he says that when you fall, this is not a cause for sadness. Mm. But what is a cause for sadness? Is that when you remain in the fall. Right. And right, and this is the whole difference. When the devil steps in when you fall, right? You're trying to combat this passion, and the devil steps in and says, You fell. You're no good. You're not like those Christians. You're not like those saints. Christianity is not meant for you. You're not like those guys, right? And then he leads you to despair. But the reality, and then he continues and he says, This, when you fall, this is something that is human. Mm. It's part of the weakness of your nature. But if you remain fallen, now this is devilish, yeah. which changes everything, right? So, so the idea is if I want to get rid of this sin, and because there is deep addiction, I shouldn't be overwhelmed with negative emotions when I fall. I need to try to put things into perspective, understand that the devil is a liar and the father of all liars, and I understand that he's talking to me in that way to put me down for me not to get up again but god will never talk to me this way like father anthony was just saying he would never talk to me this way so so we recognize right away it is the devil it's not god and if i recognize this then i need to get up and if i put things into perspective if i realize that through my struggle because this is the main key to spiritual life is to struggle to do what is good and struggle against sin and if i have been struggling let's say for a week or two weeks and i haven't fallen at all I fell one day, regardless of the sin. But I get back up, and I fight another week. I fall again. I get back up. I fight another two weeks. So if I take a step back and look at that month, hey, I fell three, four times. But I used to fall 10, 15 times. That's huge, right? So, so if we're able to take the amount of falls and increase the distance between them, that means we are progressing towards sainthood. Like the shackles of sin are being removed from us through the struggle that we, we give and through the grace of God. And if, if, forgive me, but if I may also, the amount of time that you're staying up is even longer you know, because if you stay resurrected and, it, and you're not remaining in the fall, that's the most important part, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's actually, uh, there is a lie that so many of us believe that is whispered to us by the devil, which is, 
and we we're as human beings we love to count right we love to have like a really hot streak of like, <laughs> it's been 30 days it's been 60 days it's been a year right uh so what does the devil do as soon as he does manage to trip you up and you fall he immediately hits you with it's all lost everything mm-hmm. is lost yeah right and now you got to restart you got to rebuild which is absolutely silly and the image i want people to adopt is when you're running a marathon if you're at the front of the race so let's say you're running a 40 kilometer marathon i don't even know if that's a thing cuz clearly i don't <laughs> run marathons but <laughs> don't look at me <laughs> but let's let's say it's a 40 kilometer marathon and at the 30th kilometer for whatever reason you trip up and fall there's no judge that jumps out of the bushes and says ah you fell it's over go back restart 30 kilometers are lost go back start line nobody does that the moment that you get up the very next step you take is towards the 31st kilometer mm. nothing is lost if we could just stop believing his lies and recognize that Christ is saying if you get up right now the very next step that you take is going to be towards yet another step towards a victory but what do we do we say ah oh, i fell i messed up my next confession is in two weeks. I'm going to live it up from here until my next confession. Worst decision ever. It's horrible. I'm going to indulge. People do that with their diets. I broke my diet. Well, until I restart a new one, I'm just going to binge. <laughs> Eat whatever I want. That is such a horrible, horrible understanding of what it is that you're supposed to do. You fell. Get up. And once you've gotten up, then like you said, this is where you begin to, yet again, live the life of victory and resurrection. Mm. I think... It- in like a layman's term, the thought process there is, I'm going to have to go to confession anyways. I'm down. I'm dirty. I won't be cleansed again until I re- get my absolution and, and, and confession and all that. So the thought process is that the devil puts in your head is, well, until you get that absolution, you're filthy anyways. You, know? you might as well. You might yeah. as well. Which is, but that's insane. Like, like that, that's insane. So we have to, can I, can I say a story that maybe you can, summarize how big of a lie this is. Uh, so there's a story in the Desert Fathers where a monk asks his spiritual father to speak to him about sin. So he tells them, he tells him, go gather your brothers, the monks. And they start to take a walk, right? And then as they walk, they see a small plant. So he tells the monk, approve this plant. So the monk is like, okay, whatever. Like he takes the plant, he throws it out. They continue walking. He tells them, see that small tree? Uproot the small tree. He's like, what? He's like, uproot the tree. So they go, they get like wh- whatever, and, and they start digging, like, and the other monks help him, and they uproot the tree. It took a lot of effort. It was obviously a smaller tree. Then, then he tells them, what does this have to do with sin? He's like, just relax, come. <laughs> <laughs> I love the desert pauses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of pain and suffering, yeah. but there's always a point at the end. Yeah, yeah. they're so chill. Yeah. <laughs> um, they continue walking, and now he sees a huge tree. Obviously, deep roots. He asks them, uproot this tree. He's like, what do you mean? Or like 20 guys trying to uproot the other tree took forever. What do you mean? And he goes, this is how sin is like. When you allow sin to continue growing in your life, it becomes this humongous tree. In the beginning, it's a very small plant. You easily uproot it. And that's what happens. That's, so when the devil tells us, okay, you know, binge in that sin, right? then what you're doing is that you're actually increasing the addiction within you, right? Another imagery is that you are digging a deeper hole under you, right? And then you have to get out of this. So something to definitely keep in mind. Also sometimes, like just one thing I want to chime in as well, uh, what Father Anthony said and you, Paul, said as well, about how we feel bad when we fall, uh, sometimes I think this stems out of pride. At least that's what St. John Chrysostom seems to say. He says that when we fall, we're so shocked that we fell, as if, hey, how come I didn't get 100%, mm. right? And as if I- I'm perfect, and therefore, if I'm not getting 100%, then let me, you know, again, binge in that sin. And we have to recognize that we, we are human we are weak and therefore that's why we cling to god and our hope is in him that's awesome so my next question is if you can just clarify healthy sexual desire given by god 
to eventually get married and fulfill all the three things that we started with versus lust. Mm-hmm. How does one navigate that? Because a lot of people walk around with like a guilt that they have this innate sexual desire, but I feel like that's something yeah. within us. So the, the, the church teaches that there are four different expressions of love. And one of them is eros. Eros where we get the word erotic. Oh. But unfortunately, like so many other beautiful things that have been handed down to us by the church, words get sabotaged very quickly, right? So eros has become erotic and erotic has become something that is um, inappropriate and sinful and filthy and so on and so forth, right? But the word eros was always meant to depict that very specific kind of love that is very passionate, that is very intimate, and that is very relational, right? The human being was given the faculty of being able to express that very specific kind of love, okay? And that kind of love, one of its expressions is expressed in the fact that a husband and wife can come together and share in that intimacy, that deep and profound expression of love that they have for one another. When done within the confines of marriage, husband and wife, when done within the confines of that committed covenantal relationship that we spoke about, then it's always going to lead to something beautiful. And its most ultimate expression is that kind of love will lead to life. That, that's, not, that's not accidental. God intended for this very process of how this specific love of Eros is expressed will ultimately lead to two people being able to bring about life. Let, let me throw out something that might be scandalous for some people. Some of the fathers will even say that the kind of love that moved God to bring about creation. Remember in the liturgy of St. Gregory, you talk about how it is that when God created humanity, he says, it's for the sake of goodness alone that you have brought me into existence when I was not. Those are the words that St. Gregory the theologian uses, right? But what moved God to want to bring about creation? They call it manikos eros. The idea of this what? This crazy love. But the word that is used there is that love eros, that love that out of, for the sake of relationship, for the sake of intimacy, for the sake of that deepest expression of love, God creates from that place. So there is very clearly a beautiful expression of how that love is meant to be able to bring people together and ultimately bring about life. But remove God from the equation like Father Gabriel was saying. And what do you have? Instead of relationship, you have only something that is transactional. It is no longer relational, it is transactional. You offer something, I take it from you, and that's the end of it. When you remove the aspect of intimacy and love, what do you have? Lust. Instead of offering myself, I only desire to take from you. This is why, unfortunately, some people make the mistake of thinking that, oh, once I get married, you've given me license to have sex, so therefore I can do whatever I want. No, hold on. There is such a thing as a lack of chastity even within marriage. Yep. If a husband or a wife decide to abuse their spouse where they only want to take from them, they're not interested in relationship, they're not interested in connection, they're not interested in offering love, they're only interested in taking, 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 taking. It's not because you're married that you're not committing something that is sinful. You've introduced sin into that marriage bed was, which was meant to be undefiled, according to St. Paul. The marriage bed was meant to be a place of intimacy, relationship, connection, and sacrifice. Instead, we've turned it into a place where it's a marketplace, and I get to live out the fantasies that I have been harboring within me for decades. And forgive me, Father, is it not, does it not follow that something like the Eucharist, where we eat God's flesh and drink His blood to be one with Him, comes from that same deep love of being within each other desiring to be one just as he gave us to do that with our wives so what's another word that we use for eucharist we use it all the time communion mm. that idea of communion is when two come together when they become one you see this, this is exactly this is why it's so important to understand this and please don't misunderstand what we're saying we're not saying that there's anything sexual about the eucharist actually that that's where i was going to interrupt you I feel like we're so afraid of the sexual or the word sex because it's turned into such a dark thing or such a, a filthy thing 
Whereas God meant it as such a holy thing. 100%. That is such an example of his love for us that it might be refreshing for the youth or for people in general to understand this really is a beautiful thing that it mimics a relationship with God himself, that it's not a filthy thing. It's not a perverted thing. That it's, it's, it, it models itself on the relationship we have with God, being one with him in the Eucharist. All things that are good and holy have been granted to us from him who gave us his very image. Where we would make a mistake is think that what we are trying to say is that this love, this intimacy, this deep desire for relationship and connection, which is all part of sexuality, is only limited to the physical act of sex. Of course not. Nobody's talking about the physical act of sex within God. That's clearly not what we're saying. What we are saying is that sexual faculty, that desire for intimate connection and relationship, is something that we've taken from God because we've even seen him express it towards us. Hence why the imagery of talking about the bridegroom and the bride. Hence why we even say that one of the titles we give to the Holy Theotokos, we call her what? The bridal chamber. Why do we call her the bridal chamber? Because it is in her that divinity and humanity became one. Mm. This, this union, this, this speaking of how it is that we desire to be one with one another. Now, all of this is taken from our model of wanting to be one with God and God desiring that we choose Him, that we reciprocate the love that He has offered to us. Remove God from the equation, what do you have? Absolute chaos. It becomes destruction of another human being, not a deep desire of sacrifice and love and relationship and connection. I think one of the most beautiful things, Father Anthony, that you mentioned is that how God created us out of love, which is the reality of our faith, right? So, so out of His love, life was brought out. And when we learn to love like He loves, the same happens. So we co-create with God. Right? Yeah. And that's why God gives us this commandment to co-create with Him. So I want to emphasize the point again is that as a Christian, I love like God loves. I mean, w w we have to be uh, very um, realistic with ourselves that, that sometimes we allow the world to creep in, right? And we start to redefine love as the world defines love, right? So when we find someone that is 14, a 14 year old is dating, what, why are you dating? I mean, so we date for the purpose, as Christians, we date for the purpose of marriage. You're not ready to be married. What are you doing? Right? Uh, but, 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 I, but I love her. No, 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 you, you don't love her. You like her. Okay, you have emotions for her, and that's very natural at your age. No problem there. But you have to be able to control your emotions, right? And, and when you do so, that will set you on the right path towards holy union with the spouse that you choose at the right time. And it's all done in God. And it's so beautiful. It's, it's, it's gorgeous, right? So let us not be hasty. Right? I'm talking to youth, maybe high schoolers. Let us not be hasty into finding our partners. Let us, let us wait until we grow, until we find ourselves, we know ourselves, our personalities are developed all in Christ and we, we love him and he's the foundation of our life. And only then am I able to actually choose my spouse because this is the second most important decision I make in my life. Choosing God is number one. Choosing my spouse, my spouse is number two. Maybe my spouse as well. Salt on the <laughs> so choosing my spouse is number two. Everything else comes after. So again, just learning to love like God loves. This was wonderful. It really was. I think that takes us to the end of it. It wasn't so tricky. It wasn't so bad, was it? No, not at all. Well, I think it was enjoyable. It was enjoyable. There Definitely. is something I want to throw out, though. Tell me. Because there's people who might be tempted to say, hold mm -hmm. on, you've talked about sexuality strictly within the confines of marriage. Does that necessarily then translate into a person who doesn't marry, a person who remains celibate, whether in a life of consecration or otherwise? 
Am I then supposed to just suppress my sexuality? Well, again, let's go back to the conversation about how it is. That sexuality is holy and sacred and a gift from God to humanity and a reflection of how he created us in his image, right? You will always be a sexual human being, even if you are a celibate or even a consecrated um, monk or nun. Your sexuality doesn't disappear. The only thing that you are not going to do is express it through the physical act of sex. But that intimacy that you can have with people can be had in brotherly love. That connection that you desire to have with another human being can be done with the people that you serve and the people that you live with, the people that you call brother and sister in Christ. That desire for you to be able to expose yourself to a certain level of intimacy can also be had in relationships that are happy, healthy, and Christian. And so none of that gets set to the side. But where people get really upset is when they say, but hold on, but now you're telling me that I can't be sexually active. Of course. Sexual activity is, and this is defined by God, if you disagree, your argument is with God, it's not with us. God is very clear that that sexual activity, that physical sexual activity, is strictly for the husband and the wife within the confines of marriage. But your sexuality is not to be set aside just because you are a celibate. You have a role to be a healthy, sexual human being, even as a celibate, without you having to express it physically through the physical intimacy of sexual act and union. And even as a celibate, I, have div- I could have a divine erotic love towards God, right? So that passion for God, again, sexuality, like your reverence was saying, is not only something that is physical, Course. Right, so it's it's on all three levels, like spirit, soul, mm-hmm. and body, and the union is in all three levels. So I think that's also a reminder that if I choose as a celibate to offer my sexuality to God, that it is a sacrifice that is given to Him, and my entire being is still found in Him. That was lovely. I think my takeaway, definitely takeaway. I am not my sin. It doesn't define me. That to me is life-changing advice. I think our ability to love God with such a passion, such a fervor, that would be definitely number two on the list. And three, do not be ashamed to talk with your priests. They are clearly cool and able to handle it. (laughs) So that should be your takeaway. Talk with your father in confession. They've heard it all. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul.